good afternoon and welcome to the Low Art Museum's annual Art Week Bubbles and Brunch. My name is Jill Dupy, and I am pleased to be the director and chief curator of the Low Art Museum. It is an exciting time of year for our city whose burgeoning cultural scene has enjoyed the art world's spotlight these past few days. The Low, Miami's first and oldest art museum, is honored to be a part of Art Week and a partner of Art Basel Miami Beach. We are equally proud to be featuring Michelle Okadoner's Into the Mysterium exhibition this season. One of today's foremost artists, Okadoner regards nature as a palimpsest onto which all creatures' passage through this mortal realm is inscribed. She sees vestigial remnants of the existence of an existence that is both eternal and fleeting in the twigs, stones, pebbles, leaves, sticks, seeds, pods, shells, husks, and snakeskins that she encounters on routine walks, whether on the beach, in the woods, or in the garages of suburban Miami. They are disjecta membra, or scattered fragments, that can be knit back together into new stories by those who are truly in touch with the rhythms of nature and mankind's majestic legacy. Michelle Okadoner is precisely that person. With her Midas touch, she transforms what others might call detritus, but what she would label lovingly Mother Nature's marginalia into works that are as notable for their material beauty as they are for their intellectual impact. They equally speak to her deep interest in civilization's push-pull relationship with nature, as well as the paper-thin membrane separating order from chaos. In the midst of it all, Michelle Okadoner not only sees but also gives shape to the spirit world, a profound thread of energy and memory that binds us all across time and space. In a nutshell, she is a modern day shaman. Understanding her intellectual and aesthetic priorities provides an invaluable lens through which to view into the Mysterium. Born of an ostensible fact-checking visit to the Marine Invertebrate Museum at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science on Virginia Key, the Mysterium project is the fruit of the artist's enchantment with the hidden museum and its more than 90,000 specimen jars. When she fatefully crossed the museum's threshold more than a decade ago, Michelle was inspired to capture what she saw there. Whispers of an ancient time embodied in the creatures whose subtle beauty was otherworldly. And thus, she entered the Mysterium, taking us back to our aquatic roots and inviting us into what she refers to as a oneness of being. So Michelle, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you on this beautiful and critically important project. Thank you for your generosity, your alacrity, and your grace that you brought to this collaboration. And thank you for sharing this beautiful body of work with us and with our many audiences. Your images and the unique and fragile spe specimens they represent on levels both microscopic and macroscopic have played a special role in furthering the Lowe's commitment to serving as an invaluable resource for education, engagement, enrichment, and let us not forget enjoyment. And facilitating partnerships with a range, our partnerships with a range of institutions both on and off campus. I would also like to thank our remarkable sponsors, above all pre presenting sponsor, Fiduciary Trust Company International. Thanks are also due to Mitchell Kaplan and his marvelous team at Books and Books. I hope you all had a chance to enjoy their pop-up store back at the low. Uh, deep thanks go to our long-standing partner, Bose Art, which has been with us for a remarkable 65 of our 67 years here at the University of Miami. Also, thanks are due to the city of Coral Gables, to Miami, the Miami-Dade County uh, Cultural Defense, excuse me, the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs and the Cultural Affairs Council, as well as the Miami-Dade Mayor and the Board of Commissioners. And finally, I reserve my last word of thanks for my staff, whose, educa whose dedication, rather, is rivaled only by their talents, and for our many members. You make everything we do possible. And now, without further ado, I invite you to join me in welcoming Michelle Okadoner. Jill is a wonderment, really. I um, visited her 
as the show at the Perez was uh, about to close because the work with the Mysterium here at the University of Miami uh, came after Tom Collins had curated that exhibition. And I felt that it needed to be seen and understood all the years that Norway has had their seed bank, I was so fascinated by the notion of it. And I realized that here in Miami at this university, there was what I then called a wet seed bank. I went online and found out that Norway has the seed bank. There's 70,000 seeds in it. And here at what I've called the Mysterium, there's almost a million specimens. So what a treasure there is on campus. And it was wonderful that the low of all places, you know, an art museum, which shouldn't be so unusual, but it is, it would feature an exhibition based on one of its science programs. Um, I'm told that art and science, art and biology in particular, is the largest cross-section of study in uh, college universities today, and I can see why. It's where I began my journey. I'm going to begin uh, many years ago. So uh, I'm the one in the striped bathing suit, <laughs> and I'm thankful for the way you can open up the screen. I'm thankful for technology. Uh, and I could see that my hand was actually grabbing something, that I wasn't just uh, searching. I was really, the hunter-gatherer in me began very early. And uh, that's about near where the one is now. The, we had a cabana at the Roni Plaza. Most of you must know by now I was born and raised in Miami Beach. And there was no television you know, and uh, wasn't listening to the radio. So I was out and about, and it didn't really affect these very wonderful early years where nature was my great teacher and the great giver to me of a first language, uh, visual language. And thanks to Howard Gardner at Harvard, who ex extended reading and math intelligences into seven intelligences, the third one being visual literacy, I understood what it was and why I always loved hieroglyphics and anything Egyptian. Uh, that's probably 70 years later than the first slide, and that shows I was still, I'm still there, I'm still hunting and finding wonderful things. This slide is working at um, the, what was the old Concourse A, and today we're honored Vivian Rodriguez is in the audience, and she was the head of Art in Public Places who invited me to submit a drawing. Uh, Vivian found me. She went to a conference of public art advocates um, and saw a work I had done for the Sacramento Central Library. Uh, based on literacy, another thing I love is books called Codex Lexicon, Lexicon Codex, and uh, again, having to do with symbolic language. So this was our language. The thing that's so wonderful about a walk on the beach is not that I did it, it's that it manifests the beauty that surrounds us here in South Florida and makes our journey here very, very unique. We're the only subtropical part of the United States. And I was always aware, even if I went into northern Florida, the differences of the trees and the differences of what I could find. And we are blessed with the Gulf Stream and palms, which uh, we, we don't really freeze. And of course, our origin story is when they had the great freeze in the late the 19th century, I think it was 1886 or 96, Julia Tuttle sent Henry Flagler a sprig of orange blossoms and said, bring your, extend the train down here. So that's how we began. Uh, the airport was originally called, and I still refer to it as a walk on the beach. 
when American Airlines took over the, uh, the concourse and extended it to what we now call the North Terminal, or Terminal D, I guess. They, um, being from Texas, they had a different view and they didn't like black. So I had to move it to a white floor and come up with a new thought that it wasn't really, a new thought wasn't required, but there, I had to figure this one out. So I said, oh, well, the beach leads to tropical gardens. So that's how we got this image bank. And um, these still, there's palms and the notion of shade and the notion of uh, branching, which is one of the magical patterns. And there's five magical patterns. There's, um, this one has wave. You can see the, the movement in the arms. Branching you saw before. Uh, random dot you can see here. Uh, the other two are spiral and geometric. I won't leave you hanging. And so these are the pieces that evolved for the white section of the floor. So now you know why there was white and black. Now, interestingly enough, and you're the only ones in the whole county, probably the whole country, who will ever know this, um, the black floor, which is, uh, has some North Carolina granite and some uh, Wyoming aggregate, that's the older part of this country. And so you have to know a little bit about geology to be a working artist. Uh, you have to know about geology to live today, as a matter of fact, but not 20 years ago. So the black floor was harder, and the white floor is Alabama and Georgia white, and um, they are softer. It's a younger part of the country, and the aggregates are not as hard. So how I finally got the floor back to black, which I thought would last better with the um, wheels on luggage, things are always changing. It's not just foot traffic anymore was the fact that finally uh, the white did begin to show more wear. And so you probably have the only grandfathered granite floor. It's a, it's a staley granite from North Carolina in the United States. The mother of pearl was not in the original drawing because I had no idea it existed. When I began the airport, I didn't imagine all the concessions. The drawing went down a concourse. Then the reality came of um, you know, food stands and carpeting in them and the contrast. And I was looking for what I called a framing device. In some way, I'm always trying to separate the vernacular from the sacred. So I imagined when I was walking on the beach, the kind of white foam of the waves and how am I gonna figure this out? And I looked down and there was some water and some you know, beautiful bits and pieces of shell fragment and I thought, ah, mother of pearl. So there was no internet when I needed it in the early 1990s. So I went, I think there was like one 800 mother of pearl or something. You know, you had these 800 <laughs> numbers. So I found a man in San Francisco who was in the terrazzo business and explained my desire and my plight. And he said, I can buy the, ref, the, um, the, the scrap, the refuse from button factories in the Philippines. When do you need this for? And that's what he did. And if you look down carefully, and especially in the older part of the airport, you'll see the cuts from buttons. The newer part, I made a business for him. He now has a huge business and moved to Paris. And, uh, but the early ones, the old Concourse say, you can still see remains of the buttons. So Vivian was so wonderful, Vivian Rodriguez, and I said, Vivian, I need this mother of pearl. She said, well, what for, what is it? So I told her and she gave me an addendum to the contract. So now you know how your county works. It was really in where your taxpayer money goes. So that's looking down at the, uh, with what my terrazzo man, I learned different languages called the knuckle, which I called the rotunda. And uh, it became not a walk on the beach, but what I call a philosophic essay. We always were aware that life came from water. We didn't know then how. We thought 
that it was struck by lightning, and that's what moved early particles to accelerate. We know now it came from, or we think we know now, it's always changing, from asteroids that came with a little bit more of um, matter and fell in the waters, and that was the beginning of the chemistry of life on Earth as we know it. But when this opened in 1995, I was certain, here's the essay, that it was not so. So you see there, uh, early life forms. I had made about 2,000 pieces by this time, and I wanted a sort of a more intense vocabulary. I took books that had microscopic photography of shells and cells and all kinds of, you know, structures, and put them in here and learned so much about algae and, uh, you know, we always learn about amoeba and paramecium, but it doesn't go much further. Maybe today it does. So this section was speaking. And when Dr. Robert Ginsburg from the Rosenstiel School went to pick up Dr. Andrew Knoll from Harvard, who was head of invertebrate um, paleontology, after the Concourse A opened, he got off the plane, and that was before the TSA, so Robert Ginsburg could meet him at the gate, and he said, what the, what's going on here? So they called Miami Art and Public Places. They found out what was going on there. They got my phone number, and they called me, and then they said, literally, D did you, do you know what you're doing? So I wasn't there. That was my voicemail got that. So I called them back and got their voicemail or tape in those days. And I said, I think, I don't know what I'm doing. I think I know something. So they invited me down, and Dr. Andrew Knoll gave a lecture at the Rosenstiel School of early life forms using slides from uh, a walk on the beach, but this part, what I call the essay, the philosophic essay. And Vivian Rodriguez and I proudly represented the county and, uh, and uh, had a great time. So you could see some of the early cells. And what I love is this one. This is salt as it lines up on its axis. So salt water, you know, is what we come from. And our body is a great percentage of saline solution. We have an internalized ocean in us, which is why we theoretically respond to the phases of the moon, and we've come up in our great folk wisdom with the notion of lunatics. <laughs> you can see, by the way, the beautiful mother of pearl, and how I used it also to make the cosmos. When you look at the stars at night, you don't see um, one, you see a, a change of scale, a depth of field, and you are then drawn into what our earliest ancestors saw, which is the notion of infinity. And that's also as a result of all of the different crushings I got. I mean, Mother of Pearl didn't exist in sacks at that point. We just got this stuff. And then we learned that we had big pieces, small pieces, we sifted, and I loved what it did. So many people comment that it also looks like the, the cosmos, like the sky, and it does due to the depth of field that we were able to produce. So these are also abstractions. These come from, uh, these are early life forms, and they come from French m uh, micro photography books from the 40s, and of course the French were so great with their microscope, they had Louis Pasteur and Madame Marie Curie, and I have several books in my library now covered with wax that uh, I used. And again, you see how the mother of pearl created a field. This is, you know, just a fanciful piece, but it's the notion of, you know, the clustering of cells. All the pieces take so much time that if they weren't talking to me, in, in dialogue with me, I probably wouldn't have had the patience to spend so many years working on them. And this is the cover of the new book, Everything is Alive, 
which had been a thought I had, and one of the writers for the book, Judith Thurman, said, no, Michelle, that's the title. I do believe everything is alive. And uh, I read a Chinese, the first novel ever written, it's actually Chinese, called The Dream of the Red Chamber. And um, I read it in the late 60s. It became, it was translated and became a cult book where I was in school in Ann Arbor. And it begins, um, all men are like stones who inhabit the earth, and it has the notion there of everything being alive. I think that our ancestors who were closer to the ground as it moved and also looking up um, had more of that feeling than we have today. So works of art should both be moving forward into examining the future and the wonders of IA, the fears of IA, but also keeping a foot in the past. This is a rubbing from actually a seat I made, and that is uh, graphite, and it is cosmos, and it's in the book. It's the, cent it's the uh, frontispiece, actually, and it came from the same period, uh, 19, early 1990s, so it's wonderful. I went back and forth on paper and rubbing the waxes before they left, and it was a many-layered um, Production and there's a book, workbook that was in the. It's out at the low in the pop-up bookstore. That also came. That was the book that led me to the Miami Invertebrate Museum. But it, it was part of the process also. So these are what I call process pieces. Earlier I showed you what's called a um, proposal drawing. So I've always kept the hand busy. The eye hand brain, the trilogy of that is, goes back to Lascaux. Uh, here I'm sprinkling aggregate. Uh, I lear I've learned to paint on these floors. This is the, when they redid the floor and joined the old concourse A to D, uh, we needed to come up with a new quote unquote knuckle, a new rotunda, and so I abandoned the notion of putting bronzes in because it would be hard to can make the connection and decided just to try and see how this went and they they work remarkably well it's uh, actually very joyful and with the technology of epoxy resin you don't have expansion contraction joints you're you're quite free so that energy of um, this is the other rotunda, the galaxy, which the county thought was a hurricane and called me up and bawled me out. And I said, you just don't know anything about astronomy. I sounded very, very outraged and they, they uh, went away. So, um, but it, it has, it's, you have to stand there and really throw it. You can't put it down. You have to show up with your team you know, 6.30 in the morning, and you have to be ready to get it in quickly. It sets up fast. So you, ha you have to really dive into it, literally. It's an ocean of, of terrazzo aggregates, another kind of ocean. That's the piece, looking down on it. That's about 55 feet in diameter. So this is a um, different kind of uh, approach to my understanding of the ocean. What you're looking at is softer material, sponges, that I use to create forms. So I've always felt when I looked at my hand and saw the veins and looked at a leaf and saw the veins and then went in a plane and looked down at the rivers and saw the tributaries, that that oneness was uh, existed, but other people weren't really uh, aware of it. So I wanted to make human bodies that were not of flesh and blood, but like they could have come out of the ocean or could have been built by plant life. So this one, which is called Reef Alive, 
uh, is one. And then to get the whiteness that you would get in the limestone, I discovered a chemical called bismuth, which is really quite beautiful and goes on uh, very, very quickly. You, you know, the technical parts of all these pieces are really wonderments. They, and it's fascinating to discover them and it's very, very exciting. And part of that process is also what's kept me fresh working so many years. It's when you make a mistake and you say, oh, that's fabulous, what is that? Or something is, you know, you put on the chemical too hot and it goes quote unquote the wrong way. So this is bismuth and look at how beautifully it replicates the coral, the sense of it. This was, a, I called it um, sargassa. And um, afterwards I noticed that with, it, it kind of had, the knee was giving from all of the pushing of the melting I was doing with a heat gun. I was bearing down on this piece so badly that she gave and then I said, oh my gosh, looks like Michelangelo's the slave. So I loved the gesture. So, so much of this work, not the, of course you can't do that with terrazzo and a floor people are walking on, but in the studio, I can roll, I can move with the way the materials go, with, how, with the heat, with the weight. All these things are part of the process. That's why everything is alive. Now, these three pieces were in, in an exhibition in 2008 in New York, and then the University of Michigan opened their new museum and uh, bought the three. And they're outside, and I'm told that the students love them for initiation rites, and <laughs> that they're used in various ways. I do get photographs, I get, you know, all the time. With, they get draped with ivy, many, many things. It's, it's quite exciting. So the one on the, le on the left has uh, the striations of formations of coral. And the middle one is uh, the female, and she has all kinds of organic materials, uh, you know, she's taken on that uh, just quite, it's quite beautiful. I, I see when I see it almost a life form crawling on her. And the one on my right, the large one is called, yeah, it's on you, Angry Neptune. I have a few more Angry Neptunes to make. I just have to um, think of, you know, new titles. That's part of the homework right now. But the notion, when I made this in 2007, really, I wasn't as aware of just how angry Neptune should be. Now this is a project that, uh, the new book, Everything is Alive, has the airport in it, finally published after so many years. And it has five other installations nobody has seen, I believe. This one is a private installation in the Keys. And it came from, again, the language of the beach. So. Here's a way of laying out things I found that wouldn't really work, let's say, for the airport floor because that was very dependent on shape and texture. These are really a, a, a language of vocabulary. They're more, some of them painterly. They're, uh, they, don't, they don't fit the theme and I certainly wouldn't do figurative or faces that were being walked on. So they had a different notion. And there's something now that is a new book out this year called Intuitive Alphabet that was also in your, uh, the Lowe's store that um, came out of this installation which was at the Lowe. Now when the Lowe was curated by Tom Collins, he said, why don't you show me 40 works you think are significant in your body of work? And then he said, and bring the whole studio down because I love the context. And they'll have a heart attack if, they, if we do the thousand small pieces you're going to bring. So we'll do a shadow exhibition. Are you up for that? I said, of course. So that's what we did and this was part of it. And then uh, somebody, a new publisher here in Miami, saw this and asked me to do something with it. So, but that was part of the proposal for, you can see the drawing, 
for this home, which was um, in, it's in the Keys, and it's a very spectacular house. It's very clean and simple. That said, it has all Nakashima furniture, and you can't drag seaweed and things inside. So they were kind of removed from the natural setting because you had to take your shoes off even to be in this house, and it was air conditioned. So I got them going, and uh, we redid the terrace. I called it the Sunrise Terrace, and uh, that plant is called, correct me, I can't really, Zizu. Does anybody, do I have it right? It's a special grass that grows up in a puff. We replaced what was there with oolitic limestone and made, uh, these trees had been weeds, these are native trees, but instead of pulling them out like they had planned, we let, made little islands. I said, we're going to do a kind of a Japanese garden. You, know, you have to word things in a certain way. You have to say, they're not weeds, you know, they're a Japanese garden, so here we go. And uh, this is a 1936 hurricane tower built after the tragedy of 1935, which washed away Isla Morada. So um, it had a, a cistern on top, and it was, it's a historic structure, even though it happens to be on these people's property, Monroe County wouldn't let them tear it down, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they brought me down, and they said, well, what would you do with it? So I did see it as a place they could uh, use and gather things and begin to, I began to share my language of what I saw on their property. Oh, look at this, look at that. Oh, this leaf is special. So one thing led to another, and I put the trellis up. He, the person who, whose property it is, kept saying, so what, what are you going to paint it? What color are you going to paint it? What are you going to do? How are you going to paint it? And I kept saying, I don't know, you know. Well, how, you know, it was such an interesting thing. But when you saw the round uh, Zizu slide, this has that same energy. Instead of being horizontal, it's, it is that shape in space. So we did this vortex around that follows that uh, pattern. And we have native snake cactus and vanilla. Uh, we brought back vanilla, which of course, if you know anything about vanilla, it has to be hand fertilized. And I said to this very um, busy businessman, man, I said, you're going to have to come down here every weekend and pollinate your vanilla vines. <laughs> so we've had such a great time. Now, point of pride, this piece, we call it the shaman's hut. This piece, the shaman himself, found floating up on their beach, he survived Irma. Now, he's not nailed in. I stuck him in, I wove him in, and they are, uh, it's as close to the water as I am to the projection booth. So how that happened, don't ask. So he sent me a slide. He was pretty distraught about his property, but he said, the shaman lives, and there he is. You can see the roots, too. It's, such a, it's of the snake cactus taking hold. Soon the whole structure will be covered, and it will really be enchanted. It comes right out of my love of um, Snow White and the, you know, and the Sleeping Beauty, all the, myth, the stories, the mythic stories of you know, enchanted places overgrown. So now we'll go, you see the snake cactus? It's called Princess of the Night. We know Queen of the Night is the night blooming Ceres, but we have a native princess. So that's looking down from the top. And what I love about this image is the door is in reflection. I had to make a door. I kept saying things like, well, what about animals getting in? You know, I mean, the, the, between Monroe County and my patron, it was a dance, but we did, we ultimately learned how to tango together. So the door had to go on, and um, the last name of the person begins with A. So I use the A, and you can see for alchemy, and it becomes an hourglass. You know, making magic when you're under the eye of Tom Dooley, the contractor, and the patron, and the county was really fun. Ah, 
you know. <laughs> Took me two years to get this project done, but they love it now, and I'm really happy. So there are the tortoise bones, turtle bones, that come up and get stuck in their tidal pools, which you saw in the opening slide. And the county now has come to him and said, can you help us with our turtle count? Can you tell us what comes up, what you find? So he's been enlisted as um, an ecological scout, so a, a new profession. And by the way, you see a piece of the bench behind there. That was, um, that's uh, mahogany, that was local, and um, the son of one of the, well, the, the ancestor of one of the founders, the Matheson family, Austin Matheson, I went to him to make the um, bench for it, and he came down and it's really, so it's all local. And the shells in the background, we found when they were digging the foundation for the guest house. And they're really old. I mean, they're so beautiful. And they're so old that the roots of I don't know what, because it's on the beach, have eaten away at, their, at the calcium. It's really at, at the bone, at the bone level they've been They've been saturated by life itself. So there, everything is alive. Those stones do speak. Now, this is another county project. Um, this is called Sargassum. It's based on the seaweeds that we all see, which are golden and quite beautiful. And they're little worlds. I used to dig a hole in the beach, and uh, we used to get to water but safe enough to be away from the way the tide was coming, but near enough so we could get the water. We would build walls, we would go in the water, pull out the golden fronds and shake them into our um, little ponds, our little lakes, and out came the sargassum fish, which is so beautiful, baby shrimp, little crabs, really wonderful things. So I went back to sargassum when I worked with uh, Danny Perez at the Intermodal Center. Now this drawing is, that's partial drawing, there's another half, but since it's 18 feet, it's very hard to see anything if you do the whole thing, and it's now at the Perez um, in their study center. Since it was a county project, I, I, and the Perez is a county museum, I thought it would, it would be nice to make the donation uh, so that we begin to have a layer in this community the way I saw Detroit having a wonderful layer. And I lived there 18 years I, or in Michigan. I loved the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I saw one day when they found the Diego Rivera drawings rolled up and people thought they were PVC heating pipes until they opened them up. So I think that moment said, when I had the drawing, and the drawing was so big, we pieced it together in the loft, but we had to, t we had to lower it out my window when we sent it down in a truck. So there's some detail. And um, again, it's a microscopic level as well. Macro, micro has always been of interest to me. And the cosmos and you know, the sky and the ocean, that's sort of in everything. There I'm working from books that have the microscopic uh, photos. And this time, it's not the French, it's the British algae mafia. And I say that because uh, Anne Atkins, who did the earliest British algae uh, uh, collections on the cyanotype, and then was followed by all kinds of scientists, opened a door, and that's 1846, you know, 1850. This is part of the presentation drawing, and you see the canopy there. You know, it's hard to tell the whole story, so I usually use uh, six feet of paper and um, try to do something that's kind of a narrative. It's funny, you see the wave, you see the random dot, branching, geometric. I never think about it, but recently, um, I made some wave patterns on a signature, and then I saw that on the page that all the patterns were there. So these are now, if you buy a ticket when you leave the airport to take the 
what I think the Mick Erlington mover, it'll show you can see this work. What's wonderful is you don't have to clean the glass on the canopy there because the looks so fabulous, uh, wet, and it doesn't need that kind of care. And the clouds work with it also. Again, it's the sky and the water. Uh, I did not etch all these panels. I did the drawing, and then we photographed every single uh, panel, and we divided it up and went on the computer to first to Chinatown in New York to uh, three Chinese uh, immigrants who I had seen something they did and tracked them down. And so in a basement, they began to sandblast and etch. And then when they got my first payment, they moved to um, over to Long Island City. And I would go over and check on the work and it would be like 18 degrees and they had a bigger place all right but it wasn't heated and by the time i was done with this project they were working and flushing and i said do you have heat this time and they said yes so there's a wonderful human element to all of these large projects and the commissions too you know art began with shamanism in Lascaux, these people were not just doing their own thing, quote unquote. They were understanding the collective hopes and dreams of their clan, of their people. The one who had the more ease with his finger painting or could pick up a stick and make a brush or as Barnett Newman wrote in his wonderful writings of an artist, um, he said the first man was an artist picked up the stick and made a movement in the sand. So I see it as a birthright, and I see it as something that goes back to the beginning of our nascent uh, consciousness. And so here, you know, these are that kind of, um, these are both the future, look at the glass, look at the technology, and yet these are our, our DNA relics. And the shadows they cast were so beautiful. Uh, so you walk in there and you see a whole other vocabulary of form. There's the uh, way it looks in installation. So we're using the ocean here as now fabricator, before it was inspiration, and with the figures it was pretty literal because I was collecting the sponges. So this is real technology now. This is a copper, as we know, is a conductor. That's a real PVC pipe in there, not a drawing rolled up. And this was a project of accretion. It was explained to me that like our bodies, which is saline solution, the ocean holds in suspension an enormous number of minerals. So the way our bodies make bone is by electromagnetic deposition. It, you need electricity to heal bones, that we understand today. The body is electric and it makes the bones and repairs them constantly. So the accretion project um, is something that I started, you could look and see uh, the beginnings here of, on, the, on my left, there's uh, not the little white things, but they start coming. There's a process here. And look at how fertile it gets. So I made sculptures for the city of Santa Monica. I won a competition in the late 1980s. Had I ever done this before? No. Um, but I, I thought this will be very interesting. What I didn't understand is that I would miss the deadline by two years because this would take a long time to figure out how to do. They were wonderful. Just like Vivian gave me the addendum, when they saw what I was doing, they gave me the extension and another one. And then um, the pieces are still there and very much loved like a landmark. Here's a figure that went underwater as my test in, of all places, um, 
city island in the Bronx. It, it was funny with a French company, of course, you know, a la Jacques Cousteau. And a Frenchman, in order to get work done there, I had to sit and have lunch with him and a glass of wine. These two small pieces are what remain um, in my studio. The small, uh, you can see one of them is an accreted figure, it was a test, and the other is mica, which is also a conductor of electricity. So I have the actual and the conceptual. And you can see those are the big pieces there. The reason why I chose that image, the image is that at the head of the Nile in ancient times there were two columns that spoke to the sailors and marked the site. And the, the echo from that is at San Marco Plaza. There are two columns there. And an architect told me about 40 years ago that he was working on a project to collect all the places that had that device of the two columns. And I never forgot it. So I made two columns because what you can't see here is, I guess you can, way in the background is the Pacific. I had to go through um, coastal clearance, and these could only be 13 feet 6 inches, which is what they are. And now I find myself in the Mysterium, which I arrived as a result of the first slide being on the beach and uh, falling in love, and then this, the airport work. I took the waxes that went from Miami Airport, and I went uh, uh, to the foundry with them, and I didn't realize that they sprayed them, that when they received the waxes, they sprayed with dichem, which you can't use now. It's a blue uh, print that, for blueprints, architects used to use it. It's quite toxic and illegal, but it was very beautiful. And so we're going back now to the early 90s. So I would get to the foundry with the waxes, and then I would see in the corner, again, paper rolled up with blue bleeding. And I said, what, what is that? It kind of looks like my work. And they said, well, it kind of is your work. It's <laughs> what we do so that if you say, this bronze isn't correct, I know I had four protrusions, not three. We could turn it over, look at the number, and pull out what group number it came from and show you what we picked up in your studio. So I had no idea they were being so diligent. So I said, well, they look really interesting. I said, well, what do you do with um, them when you're done? And they said, we throw them out. So I said, can I have them? Sure. So then I went and did my work. And as I'm driving home on the New Jersey Turnpike, I'm thinking, I want them. They're fabulous. I get home and it's like two minutes before the foundry closed and I call them up and I said, but I want them. They said, we're going to give them to you. I know I want them now, you know. So I ended up getting rolls and rolls and in part of my studio, the rafters were filled with these papers. So when the first book came out, Natural Seduction in 2003, I took rolls and rolls over to Massimo Vignelli's studio. No, he said, no, no, no. We put some of these in the back and process. No, Massimo, they're so gorgeous. Oh, no, go, to, go away with them. So after that book came out, uh, it was in 2003, and my mother passed away, and I decided to start Oka Press, and I got an imprint from the Library of Congress, and I've now done two books in my own press and that I was going to publish the working drawings because I realized working drawings are not commercially valuable, but to other artists um, and to connoisseurs they speak. So I indulged myself by publishing about 150 of them and um, then I researched what they were so that people, you know, if you name something you treat it better and I thought people just think these are pretty things. These are life forms. Without them we don't live. And then I thought, well, if the scientist gets their hand on this, this limited edition book, I don't want them to say, oh, artists, they just you know, blow over everything. They throw paint on the wall. What do they know? 
So I called the wonderful Dr. Robert Ginsburg, and I said, Bob, I need you to vet this manuscript. It's going to press. I can't do that, he said, but I've got wonderful Nancy Voss. And I met him over at the Rosenstiel School and um, went into the Miami Invertebrate Museum. And I tried to look her in the face while I was looking over her shoulder, that's for certain. And she vetted the manuscript. She was a very serious woman. She said, dear, this is not an algae. It's an alga, singular. And that's how it went. So when she was done, I asked her if she minded if I looked around. Well, I suppose so, she said. So I went and looked. She'd been there since 1951, mind you, starting in graduate school. And then I asked her if I could come back with a camera. And she nodded. And it took me a full year to gather together the resources to figure out what kind of lens to make the time. And I went back, and she was so generous and wonderful. She allowed me to take the jars, to put them in, put the creatures in a petri dish if I needed to. You know, she told me how to do it, where to do it, and then she left me alone. And it was so wonderful. And for those of you who've seen Miami City Ballet, you know I went back and was able to bring in a small aquarium and put the creatures in there and photograph there and use them for sets and costumes. The more people who become aware of what the resource is and see it and treasure it, you know, the better we will take care of our be beaches, our oceans, so there's that need to say where it came from and, you know, to put together uh, the small into the Mysterium, which I took last summer to the Rijksmuseum, and they couldn't believe it. And they had my Ann Atkins book. They bought my Ann Atkins book. It's the only example of her work now on the European continent, and it should be in the public domain. And they said, well, when I was there, because they had it, a room of its own. They said, well, are you sad? You sold it, or do you miss it? And I said, no, I have the whole Mysterium in Miami. I'm very, very happy. So that's how, that's the journey. It's uh, how I came to the Mysterium. It's um, the generosity of people in the community, some of whom, as I said, are here today, and um, thank you so much for coming and for your support of the low.